going to be able to do it, but we're going to depend on Matthias. Right. Popped up again. It's a hangout. Hangouts on air is going away August first. Okay. So I, I, if you're not getting the notification, uh, Jason, I'm not sure why, but uh, Matthias and I have got this. Okay, you're live. Okay. Oh, we're live. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I forgot we were live. Oh, Lord. That's all right. <laughs> I said if you didn't hear me. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And uh, I'm so happy to be here tonight. Uh, if you saw my eight-minute video today, you know that we're a little worried that we may not be able to have these group discussions. But uh, there is a way we can continue doing it, uh, and uh, we're going to we're going to work hard to make sure it, it uh, it's possible. But uh, for now, let's uh, let's get into this Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, tonight we're picking up where we left off last Wednesday, First uh, Corinthians chapter one beginning with verse 21. Uh, before we do, let me ask uh, Brother Cripps and Sister Renee to say hi, and sisters first. Okie doke. Hey guys, it's Renee Rowland. Brother Luke calls me lovingly the untwisted sister because I like to take verses people twist out of context to shake your foundation of your security and faith in Christ um, and explain them in context because uh we are under God's grace and we're saved by what Jesus did alone. So there's nothing in scripture that should make you feel condemned. Um, and uh, my name is actually the name of the channel, R-E-N-E-E-R-O-L-A-N-D. And I contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. It's good to see you guys tonight. And happy 4th of July, everybody. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, Brother Cripps. Yes, thank you. My name is Jason Cripps. I'm part of a channel called True Story Live. We come on, at least for now, we come on <laughs> Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Uh, and uh, we like to have discussions and uh, bring everyone to the table, regardless of their beliefs. And uh, we just have really, really shown over the past year, a little bit over a year, that um, you can be cordial and, and have integrity and carry on conversations with people that don't all believe the same thing. It's wonderful and amazing. Who would have ever thought that? Uh, and I'm part of this uh, program on Wednesdays, which I absolutely love. And I also do Monday's Milk uh, on Talking Doctrine on Mondays. And we have some exciting shows coming up. Uh, we have a, uh, on TSL, uh, we have a testimony tomorrow night uh, with little Ingstrom. So please listen to that. And then we have a Friday broadcast, which I'm sure Brother Luke will remind everyone about. Happy to be here. Hello to the chat. Yes, hi. Uh, yeah, let's let's acknowledge the chat room. Uh, chat room, uh, that's, that's our congregation in the chat room. Now, not everybody participates in the chat room. Uh, some people may just be listening and on their phone or something. I don't know how everybody's involved in this, but... If you're listening or in the chat room, uh, welcome. If you're new, uh, especially, I want to welcome you. And moderators, uh, I would say that these are moderators like the deacons and the, uh, the, the readers in the church. Uh, so make sure that you uh, acknowledge or someone, if you don't recognize them and you think they're new, uh, make sure you welcome them in the chat room, okay? And the other thing, of course, we ask the moderators to do is try to steer the uh, all the people uh, into the topic and if they start getting off topic this is a Bible study can we all stay on the subject of the Bible study uh, okay before we get into the uh, actual Bible study uh, I, I want to acknowledge that there are some people here who have responded to the video I made today uh, if you didn't see it please watch it it's eight minutes long and it tells you about a problem that we're facing in terms of being able to continue the, these kinds of programs. And, and uh, if you watch the video and you feel that you may be able to help with a solution, uh, email me at sincitypreacher at gmail.com. Uh, someone emailed me today and I tried to email them back and it got returned to me for some reason. Let me see. I just saw you in here. It was... Uh, Find you real quick so that I don't uh, 
So you know the, there's a problem. Yeah. I, gosh. Okay. Okay. Sorry. All right. All right. Well, I'm sure I'll see you make another comment and then I'll acknowledge you. But um, I, the reason I'm asking you to email me is so that uh, I can exchange uh, phone numbers with you. I mean, I, w I would. I don't mind giving my phone numbers to all, all the people who want to talk to me, but I don't feel that comfortable just putting it in a, posting it right here for enemies to grab it and try to uh, aggravate me in some way. So if you'll email me uh, and you want to talk about this or anything, uh, I will send you my phone number and then we can talk more. And uh, that it's a lot easier to try to figure out a solution when we're talking is the texting. So please, please do that if you, if you have some possible um, help for us. All right, let's go into the Bible study. And uh, if you didn't see the uh, first few studies we did on 1 Corinthians, please go back and watch it from the beginning. Right now, we'll begin with chapter 1, verse 21. KJV says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God, by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. All right. Sister? Sister Renee? Man, I, I use this verse often um, because it really is foolishness to most people. They, they, a matter of fact, they mock God's power and the salvation as easy believism. But it says that because they don't understand how can we hear a message, believe it, and be saved? <laughs> But, but God says it pleases him by the foolishness of preaching to save those of us that believe the message that we hear. And that is what Christ has done for us. So I use this verse often. I'm, I'm going to read it again. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. So through all these Greek philosophers and their heavy intellect, they they couldn't figure out God because God is spiritually discerned. And it says, uh, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Now, it's not foolishness to God, uh, but it's foolishness to them that are perishing. Foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And I, and I say that's why people mock it. It's foolishness to them to hear the message of what Christ has done for us. They'll call it cheap grace too, because it doesn't cost us anything. They, they can't get something that, that God loves us so much that it's actually free. So this verse is something I use often and I, and I love it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we, sometimes we go back a few verses earlier, but I don't know if we need any more context than that. Uh, Brother Cripps, verse 21. Yeah, absolutely. Renee, Renee did a great job. Uh, we, we talked about this. I, I touched on this last week in talking about all the philosophers and the, the Greek, um, the Greek uh, men that all these great orators that, uh, that gathered crowds and talked about the, the, uh, the finer concepts of the universe and man and, and, and creation and just all the stuff. And, um, when you read that stuff, from the aspect of a believer, some of it, some of it matches, you know, they stumble across truth sometimes in what they say, but we have to understand that God is the originator of all truth. If there's anything true, it comes from God. Um, so these people by the, by, uh, the, the wisdom of the world, um, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Um, I think that's amazing that even us, in infinite or uh, infinite people with our foolishness and our, our stumblings and our humanness, uh, God's able to use that. Um, I've heard some pretty foolish uh, preachers. I've heard some pretty foolish sermons in my life. And God can even use that. He can use a bumbling idiot to reach people for God. And I just think that's amazing how marvelous is his power that he can use the foolishness of preaching to to uh to save or uh, save people uh it's absolutely incredible and again it's foolishness to them that are perishing absolutely 
um, it is spiritually discerned. They don't have eyes to hear or, or you know, eyes to hear. They have they don't have eyes to see or ears to hear. Um, so of course it seems like foolishness to them. Mm-hmm. Yes, Amen. Uh, you know, um, most of the people uh, listening right now, I'm assuming that you are. Uh, believers uh, I'm, I'm talking about people listening live that are in the chat room that you're you're part of our congregation congregation of, of the church of the eternally secure now there is a universal church uh, it's just uh, it's it's made up of uh, all real believers in the world and that's called the body of Christ but in, in it, within that body you have uh, little groupings that get together and here we have we probably have about on the average of 600 people uh, of each one of these programs that we're running that are either watching live or watching it later and you're the people that i refer to as our congregation you're the people who are regularly participating in this fellowship and study so what i'm saying to you guys is is you're believers you understand this but to those people who either have not become believers yet because they are ignorant or because they've been resisting. Uh, uh, It's important for you to know that God is not impressed with you. I'm I'm sorry to have to break this bad news to you, but you're not really impressive to God. And uh, if you read the book of Job, you know, Job was the, the best man in the world and God had to put him in his place and tell him, you know, look, look at you compared to me. I, let's get some perspective here. And, and you need to, uh, there was a comment on one of my videos today or yesterday, or, and, and, and someone said it really is all about their pride. And I've come to the conclusion that pride, it really does boil down to pride. People are so full of pride that the simplicity of this gospel of the cross the shed blood and the free gift uh, it's too simple too easy for their pride and so um, most people respond to it as it's foolishness and especially if you dare to preach it then you are a fool i've had people when i was preaching call me a fool or crazy and i said yeah you're right i'm I'm a fool for Jesus. Crazy for Jesus. Crazy about Jesus. That's right. <laughs> you know, and I, I don't mind admitting it, but it's not insane kind of crazy. It's passionate love and, and thankfulness about Jesus. So this uh, first verse here makes me, makes me think that, well, the idea of you think you're so knowledgeable whether you've, you're studying science or philosophy or, and you think you're just too smart for this simple, foolish Christianity, a, a book just full of fables. Well, someday uh, the truth will be revealed to you uh, in a, such a way it's inescapable, but at that point in time, it's too late. That will be at the judgment and you'll be shown all the opportunities that you had and uh, all the times that you thought it was foolishness. Okay. Uh, and it says, the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, there is an argument in Christendom about what is required to get salvation. And, and the argument boils down to there's two positions. It's either... Uh, you're saved by believing, as it says here. This is what we believe. That the only thing that's mentioned here is believing. And if more was required, then I would say that Paul would have to be negligent. If he, if he, if he should have said the foolish of preaching to save them that believe and change their life and get all the sin out of their life and do a ton of good works to present to God. If that was all, if that was required, God... Um, Paul should have written it here. He's either dishonest or negligent for leaving yeah. that out. Good right? point. So uh, you're either on one side or the other. You think that believing is enough 
or believing is not enough. There's more that's required. You have to contribute something. Uh, but there are hundreds of verses that t tell us that where salvation is given to us who simply believe. And uh, there are some verses that are saying, uh, you believe and no works. So it specifically even elaborates that don't add any works to it. No contribution on your part. You better not add anything to it or you've ruined it or you've ruined it. But there's many other verses that just say, believe. But what you have to realize is that when it says that you're saved by believing, as it says here, that because nothing else is mentioned, that verse is telling you it's by believing alone. All right. Any more on that before we go to another verse? Well, I just want to say that's a fantastic point, Brother Luke. I I, I didn't uh, even think of that. Um, that's not surprising. But what is surprising is that, um, I, I mean, you're right on top of it. It seems like he would... Uh, he would fill it all in if he needed to, and that, and you can look at all of the the uh, writings of Paul. Um, he would have filled it in, you know, the way that he pounds things over and over and over again, and and gets the point home, and and even doubles back on things, over and over and over again. He would hit on that if that was needed. He would hit on it over and over and over again, and you'd be able to see it throughout Scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I forgot that we have a, a kind of a new protocol in, in our Wednesday Bible studies now. Um, we, the three of us, uh, we've all come to this conclusion that we are King James Version first. Yep. <laughs> I was 25 years in the camp of uh, King James Version only. Mm -hmm. but, but now I, I like to look at other translations, but uh, I will look at the KJV first. It's the one we trust, but we sometimes can be helped by looking at other translations. So now the protocol is we're going to look at that verse in the Amplified because it, it amplifies. That's what Brother Cripps just did. He just amplified Brother, Ren I mean, Sister Renee, <laughs> transgender James there going for you, Sister. <laughs> Uh, Sister Renee, she she amplified on that verse, and I amplified or expounded on it. So let's look at the amplified translation, and then we'll look at also the one we just added last week, a third translation called the New American Bible Revised Edition. And especially I like it because they have the more foot the most footnotes of anything I've seen. So look, we'll look at it in the Amplify here first. It says. Uh, for since the world, through all its earthly wisdom, failed to recognize God, God in his wisdom was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached regarding salvation to save those who believe in Christ and welcome him as Savior. All right. Uh, no harm done there. Uh, we did discover... Uh, who brought it to our attention? Was it last week we, we had a verse or was it uh, a different study that a verse was brought up? Of, oh, it was on the Sunday program and someone sent us a verse and was concerned what the Amplified said. It said, repent of your sins. Yeah. So we, we need to take all these modern translations and test them against the KJV. But I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time I have been happy with the Amplified's results. Yeah. But yeah, that, that, I like that, how it referred to what it was talking about. You know, the message, the foolishness of preaching. What was it preaching? It was preaching salvation by grace through Christ. Yeah, I yeah. like that. Yes, okay. Uh, and now let's look, look, look at it again, uh, this time in the New American Bible. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not come to know God through wisdom. It was the will of God through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who have faith. Uh, I don't find any fault in that. It didn't help so much, but it was not in any kind of error. The faith needs to be a little more defined, but yeah, yeah. I get you. Okay. Now let's see if there's a, oh, the footnotes didn't all come out. So I got to go over here and look at the footnotes. Let me see if there's one for verse 21. Um, yeah, it says 21 through 25. Here's the footnotes. True wisdom and power are to be found paradoxically where one would least expect them in the place of their apparent negation. 
To humanize the crucified Christ symbolizes impotence and absurdity. All right, so that's uh, the through verse 25, Paul continues making this same point beautifully. And, and this is what they're asking us to consider, that uh, to humanize this concept of someone dying for our sins and that being the solution to our problem is just, yeah, it looks like it's, hey, he, how could he save us? He's impotent. He couldn't even save himself. Well, that's that would be true if we didn't have a resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. For giving us that sign and he promised that proving his claims were true with his bodily resurrection uh okay um so now let's go to the next verse 22 uh, and i'm going to read 22 uh, maybe i'll read i'll see how far i need to go here because it's really a, a continuous thought <clears throat> okay the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe for the jews require a sign and the greeks so, seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Amen. Right. Amen. Brother Cripps, you seem eager to go. Oh, sure, yeah. So for the Jews require a sign. It's not just the Jews. Oh, my gosh. People people are looking for signs still to this day. I mean, in the charismatic movement, they they, they see signs and wonders of the healing over here and this over there and, and all kinds of craziness. And, and that somehow is supposed to equate to spiritual spirituality to, to many people, um, but specifically in the sign. And, and we know, uh, prophetically speaking, in Revelations, there's going to be a lot of that going on. But um, they're going to be false signs and wonders in leading uh, people to believe uh, in the Antichrist to come. But it, it's always been there, for, uh, the, the looking for signs and wonders. Um, and again, Paul's making the same point that, that we're making. The Greeks seek after wisdom, you know, and, and that's what we've discussed, the, how the Greeks were uh, often great or, orators. And um, they have these great speeches that are still being talked about today in their philosophies. They call that wisdom. And uh, it's, it's, the, it's the backbone of hospitals and, and universities and all kinds of institutions that still hold that up as, as wisdom. Um, but uh, Paul really gets down to the nitty gritty of it. He's, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And uh, we've talked about that in this very Bible study and what, what that stumbling block is. And then unto the Greeks, uh, foolishness. Now, uh, verse twenty-four is the one that gives me gives me that feeling inside. It's just uh, uh, just based on the truth of it. Uh, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. That's where the foolishness of preaching, uh, the the fruit of that, what it what it actually is in us. It's absolute truth, and we can cling to it. We can count on it. We can, uh, we can let the Holy Spirit flow through us and shine light in a dark world. Um, so as foolish as the, as the people are that preach it, the message itself is light and it's freedom and it's truth. And all that is found through Jesus Christ. It's beautiful. Yes. Amen. Uh, all right, Sister Renee, this is a beautiful portion of scriptures. Uh, yeah. I have a lot to say about this. Yeah, it says uh, the, the Jews stumbled at that stumbling stone. And Jesus is that stone. Jesus is that rock. He is the stone the builders rejected. And there was prophecy that his own people would reject him, but that would benefit uh, the world, there would still be a remnant of the Jews and they're temporarily blinded so that salvation can come to the rest of the nations. So, um, uh, there, God has not forsaken his people that they should fall. It says God's dealing with them and his timing. But the reason he's a stumbling block to the Jews for one, they take pride in the Mosaic law. In addition, the Levitical priesthood likes the power it has to be the one that stands in place for the people. Now, if Jesus is there, 
they are uh, the Levitical law is done away with and their position means nothing. They lose all their power. Anybody can come to the father through Christ. The veils ripped their, their ceremonies uh, mean nothing. No, they're not required anymore. In addition, they are prideful and self-righteous. They want to be saved by their law keeping. And Jesus tried to show them many times that you do not keep the law to God's standard. It, it's it's not enough uh, for you to enter heaven. I, I was laughing at what Luke said a minute ago. God is not impressed with you. <laughs> that was funny and it's true. Uh, I, I wanted to read that. And, you know, then you'll still hear the atheists with their intellectualization. They're just too smart for the gospel. They don't get it. It's not fair. It doesn't make sense. It's bloody and disgusting. I don't get all this animal side. This doesn't make sense. It's not fair. All those innocent. They they can't see how holy our God is and how that's it's supposed to be bloody and disgusting because that's what it is in the sight of God, our sin. So um, let me find the verse here. It says, uh, well, we, it, for the Jews require a sign. And, and that was true. God gave them a sign. He said, a wicked generation seeketh after a sign. Yes. Talking about the Jews. And the Greeks seek after wisdom, which Jason explained very clearly. But we preach Christ crucified. Every one of us preach nothing but Christ and him crucified and risen for salvation. Every one of us, because that's the only way to be saved. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. I just told you why. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. How can some dead Jew give me heaven, eternal life? That doesn't even make sense, right? They, I mean, honestly, that's that's their attitude. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. We know that uh, the beginning of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, there is no true wisdom without trusting in God and understanding his ways. So, I mean, that's the beginning of wisdom. But people don't get that the gospel message is God's power unto salvation. It's his way of saving you. He said, I've done all the work. Now, here's what I've done. Believe it and you'll receive it. It's that simple. But people, it, it can't work for They just cannot get it. Oh, Renee, you mentioned that the, uh, they can't meet up to God's standard. And what is God's standard, Renee? 100% perfection in thought, word, and deed. Amen. No sin in heaven. None at all. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I think that the uh, this uh, standard is, uh, we find in the verse, um, we all fall short of the glory of God. Um, and the, that glory of God was demonstrated and shown in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that all glory is for God. The Bible says that God does not share his glory. And the Bible says that Jesus gets the, the glory. Mm -hmm. More proof that Jesus is this God that deserves all the glory and praise. Uh, but to me, the, uh, when the, the Bible says uh, all fall short of the glory of God, um, is the glory was shown by Jesus Christ. It was a standard of perfection that he demonstrated, living a perfect, sinless life. And that's the standard we have to equal if we want to get, get, get eternal life without him. <laughs> so go ahead if you want to try that. But it's already too late because uh, you've already failed in your life. <laughs> you haven't been perfect. Even if you could be perfect for the rest of your life, it's too late. You failed. Uh, okay, so these verses here, uh, I'll, I'll read it in. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, uh, I know that uh, in the modern translations, uh, they uh, will use the word, instead of Greek, they use the word Gentile. I think that's probably a better way of expressing it. Uh, there, the Bible divides the world into two groups, um, the Jews and the non-Jews. Non, you're either a Jew or a non-Jew. Now, the Jews, out of the whole population of the world, all the people who's ever lived, let's say that this screen represents, uh, all the pixels on this screen represent all the people who've ever lived. 
Well, the the uh, the Jews would represent like this pen being like boom, like bing. I'm touching one one little pixel. That's that's the percentage of humanity that have been the Jews. So it's a tiny little percentage of all humanity. And then you got the rest that are non-Jews. These are called Gentiles. And that's what we should understand this rather than Greeks. Greek is a person who lives or is from the, the country of Greece. Um, and then the Bible also divides us uh, into two groups in another way. You have the lost and the saved, and the ratio is the same. Tiny, tiny little fraction of humanity are saved. Those people who don't think this message is foolishness. And the vast majority of the world who thinks it's foolishness, or the Jews say it's, uh, I can't put up with that. We want our our laws and traditions instead of this fake Messiah. That's what the Jews would say about it. Uh, so let me look at it in the uh, Amplified, uh, those verses. It says, for the Jews demand signs, attesting miracles. Uh, yeah, the um, Bible says that over and over again. And, and uh, Jesus gave them a lot of signs. Jesus performed so many miracles, I couldn't even begin to list them all. If we all put our heads together and try to remember them all, there's just too many miracles he performed for us to probably get them all. And these miracles were witnessed by hundreds of people, uh, uh, thousands of people. Uh, these were all signs. He was not healing people and feeding people and doing these miracles only out of the kindness of his heart, but he is love. Uh, but he, he did it as signs of proof. He was giving proof. He was giving his credentials. Uh, I can do these things because I'm God, as he claimed. He said he was God. Uh, then they demanded, after all these miracles, they demanded even more miracles. And they demanded another sign. And he said, well, if you destroy this temple... I will raise it up in three days. Mm. And, and they didn't understand his spiritual language. And just like he told Nicodemus, you don't understand spiritual language. Being born again, you don't get it. So, But they thought he was talking about the temple in Jerusalem. If it was destroyed, that Jesus could rebuild that temple in three days. And they said, well, it took our fathers 40 years to build this temple. You're going to rebuild it in three days? <laughs> Wow, boy, he's insane. Okay, but the, the scripture says, no, he was talking about his body being destroyed with the crucifixion and then coming back to life in the resurrection as a sign. And then he was asked later, uh, later on, he's asked this sign again in, in, in near the, just before his death, burial, and resurrection. And he, he answered it this way. He said, the sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Amen. And so, again, this is a picture of his death, burial, and resurrection that would be given to us as a proof sign. Yep. That his claims were true. His claims that he is God. He is the Savior. He is the promised one. Hmm, someone's calling me. Let me see. Oh, I can't talk to him right now. I'm sorry. I'd love to talk to him. It's a brother, Don Walker, my friend that has lost his wife that I told you about. But I'll call, call him back later. Um, so uh, this they demanded a sign, and he gave them signs. Tons of miracles. And then the ultimate miracle that, that, uh, that he says is justifies us having faith in him. He says the resurrection, because of the resurrection, our faith is justified. Now, people. Oh, gosh. Gosh, you can't. Um, I better turn it off. Let me turn it off. I hope it's not an emergency. Sorry. Uh, you all right? Yeah, I was doing a little background music for you while you. Okay. Uh, so that he said his resurrection 
The Bible says the resurrection is what justifies our faith. And people claim that a lot of different ways, but I, the way I understand that verse is that um, the resurrection is what justifies us putting our faith and believing in Jesus and trusting him and, and, and relying on him, that he, he does have power over life and death because he proved it. He demonstrated his power over life and death when he raised himself from the dead, and he offers that as a proof sign to us to give us confidence in justifying you putting your faith in him. Um, so uh, the Jews demand signs attesting miracles, and Greeks pursue worldly wisdom and philosophy, but we preach Christ crucified, a message which is to the Jews a stumbling block. That, what that is, it provokes their opposition and to the Gentiles, foolishness. They say it's utter nonsense. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. All right. Um, okay. Uh, do you want to say any more about those verses before we move on? No, sir. Renee? No, no, I'm good. All right. Okay, let's go to back to the KJV verse um, verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Yes. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Renee? Yeah, um, obviously... Obviously, God doesn't have any weakness, nor is he foolish, but he's using a play on words here. And, and, and even the greatest mind of man it, it can't even compare to the smallest attribute of God. So um, it, it, I, I think the whole point of this section is to show us that these are things, like you were saying, Brother Luke, that are of a spiritual language, and they have to be revealed to us by the Spirit of God. Yeah. Otherwise, it is foolishness to us. It doesn't make common. It doesn't make sense to the world. It it does not make sense. And uh, I I think it's just showing. I mean, obviously, again, God isn't foolish, or nor is he weak. He doesn't have any of those things. But it's a a play on our on words so that our minds can understand that uh, even the weakness of God is stronger than the greatest of men. You know. Yep. All right. Thanks, Brother Cripps. I'll read it to you in the uh, in the Amplified. Uh, this is because the foolishness of God is not foolishness at all, and wiser than men, far beyond human comprehension. And the weakness of God is stronger than men, far beyond the limits of human effort. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, one thing, you know, I, I don't believe in the universe as, as I used to, as far as this unending, almost limitless uh, space right. and expanse. Uh, but, but most people believe that. And, and, and so let me relate it, this thought to that, in that uh, when we think of uh, the vastness of the universe and then all the different solar systems, and then you get down to ours and then... Uh, and then this one planet, and then us as a person, and it, how tiny we are is related to all of that. And that would be a, a good way of imagining the contrast between us and God himself. The, the, we are insignificant, and why should he even acknowledge us or care about us? We're a speck, uh, and we're full of pride and sin and self-righteousness, and it's laughable that we should be full of ourselves, and yet he loves us. Okay, let's, let's look at that in the, uh, the um, New American Bible. Uh, for uh, Jews demand sign, oh no, I'm sorry. Um, what verse are we on, 25? For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. 
Uh, all right, I'll go to the next verse from the KJV. Uh, it says uh, 26, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base these things of the world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. I forgot whose turn it is to go first. Brother Cripps, I think. Well, I was going to comment on 2025. 20, uh, did, did I miss you on that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you. I tend to do that. I don't know why. Sorry. That's okay. So I wanted to play off what you said a little bit, and and it's not that I disagree with your your assessment. You know, you're you're saying you don't believe the universe in standard terms, but most people do, and you were saying that we're a uh, uh, insignificant speck. Um, that's exactly what they teach us when they when they talk to us about the universe. They make it seem like we're this. We're an insignificant speck and an insignificant galaxy in the vastness of the universe. And I, I look at it from a different perspective, and I'm not saying this to build ourselves up in and of ourselves, but, but I would, would use your analogy and I would just go a little bit further and say that isn't it wonderful that even though we're insignificant compared to a, a God that is all powerful and all knowing and everywhere, all present. Um, isn't it wonderful that he does care about us as individuals? He, he cared enough about us, even though, you know, he, he could easily just set us aside and say, you know what, they're, they're not worth it. He, he loves us so much that even though, um, uh, we're, we're so foolish and sinful and, and we turn our backs on him and we skitter away into the woods and we've sinned against him. He cared about us so much that he sent his own son to the world to reconcile us to himself. I think that is fantastic and wonderful. Um, there, there is no chart that you could contain the attributes of God. Um, you could take the greatest man in the world by the world standards the smartest, most beautiful, uh, attractive, rich, whatever, whatever, whatever terms you use and uh, put that on a chart. And you might even have, you know, some some nice things to say about him. But compared to God, it's it, there, there's no comparison. And um, he's made strong in our weakness. God, God is strong when we're weak and we allow him uh, to be our strength. Um uh, there, there's no capacity. There's no end to his strength. There's no end to it. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there on 25, and then you can decide uh, if you want Renee to comment on 20, 26 through. 20. Yeah, yeah. Let's have Renee uh, go th uh, 26 through 29. Okay. It's all really one long thought. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Jason said. Yeah, it says, "What is man that thou art mindful of him?" Yeah. You know. So uh, it's pretty amazing because he says that he knows every hair on her head. So uh, so if we go down here, it says, um, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Uh, a lot of people that have worldly wisdom, worldly riches, uh, they don't feel their need for God. That's why yeah. it's hard for a rich man to get to the kingdom of heaven. When you have all these other things, the world celebrates you. But when you are less than and you're willing to humble yourself, God will lift you up. Amen. It says whoever bases himself will be exalted. And so you'll see him using the most unlikely people. In Isaiah, it said Jesus had no form or comeliness that we should desire him. And the Pharisees were looking for someone like Solomon in all his glory. 
Do you remember when Herod stood out in the sunshine with the sparkly robe and said, this is the, the words of a God. Remember? And then God had uh, the real God had worms devour him as he stood right there receiving worship. Yeah. Showed what kind of God he was, but man worships what he can see. Yeah. You know, and so God often uses the least like you'll see in the story of Gideon, old mighty man of valor. And he's like me, who, you know, because he hadn't done anything to be valiant, but God saw it in him and he was valiant because God declared him valiant and God made him valiant. He chose Israel, not because they were the greatest of nations, but because they were the least of people. He always chooses those that don't have anything. So the world won't say, hey, that person's great because they're such and such and such and such. But we know it's God himself moving through that person so that God gets the glory yes. for what they're doing. So he will choose, and I will finish that verse. It says, um, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if you read it, but it's, it goes with it. And the base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring not things that are. So, uh, again, it will never, God, God, you'll never see, he never uses, look at David. His own father, Jesse, didn't even consider him worthy to be considered. He brought all the rest of his brothers in and the prophet's like, nope, nope, nope. It's none of these. You sure you don't have any more sons? Oh, well, we got David. You know, he's just a shepherd boy. But God, that's the one God had chosen. The one that's considered least among the world. So uh, I love that about God, that he, he never chooses someone based on how great they are according to the world it's usually the opposite and so he exalts them that's why jesus said you know whichever one of you is the greatest will be his servant like the servant is the greatest because christ himself came not to be ministered unto but to minister and, and to and to give his life as a ransom for many Amen. and we're supposed to follow in that example jesus is the perfect example of that Choosing things that are despised. That said he was despised of men. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Uh, I need to regress to the uh, the garden. Because uh, this whole portion, everything we've been talking about so far tonight, it takes me back to this whole uh, original problem and the original purpose. The purpose was God made us humanity uh, so he can have this love relationship. And God wants to provide everything for us. Yeah. And even now, uh, even after the fall of man, and even after the fact that almost all of humanity rejects the, their creator, God's providing air and water and food and what, what we need to, to live. Hopefully, we live long enough to recognize God and believe and get, get eternal life. But that's what God wanted. He wanted this relationship of love and dependency. God wants us to need him. But what happened in the garden, I made a video titled Declaration of Dependence. Mm. I declared a declaration of dependence on God. I depend on Jesus for salvation. And Brother Cripps, when you talked about the unfolding of, uh, what was the word, unfolding uh, reliance? Oh, how did you phrase that? The, you're unfolding, uh, okay. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I'm not uh, I'm not sure what you did an interview with uh, Matthias. And you oh, about folds about of faith. Unfolding. Sorry, folds of faith. Folds, yeah. Yeah, folds okay. of faith. So we, we have faith to get, get this eternal life promise. Mm -hmm. And after we get that, the, our, 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 we, we, God wants us to have faith in him for all of our needs. Amen. He gave us what is ultimately the most important, eternal life. And now he wants to us to have faith in him to do, provide everything else that yeah. we need. We need to go to heaven with all our troubles and all of our needs. And, and uh, that's what hopefully we're, we're doing here in this 
congregation. Uh, but what these verses here are really showing us is that uh, man is so arrogant. It's, that's what it really boils down to. And it, 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 Adam and Eve, they got arrogant. They fell in the trap that was laid for them by the serpent. Yep. You could be gods. Yep. If you just knew good and evil, you'd be like God, and you wouldn't need God. You could go and make your own decisions. You could be your own God in charge. Instead of depending on God, you can be in charge. And uh, this whole, all this whole portion of scriptures is telling me that how foolish this arrogance of man is. Let's look at the Amplify for those verses and see how it states it. Uh, what verse is this? Okay, I think it's 26. Just look at your own calling. Believers, not many of you were considered wise according to human standards. Not many powerful or influential. Not many of high and noble birth. But God has selected for his purpose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, revealing their ignorance. And God has selected for his purpose the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, revealing their frailty. God has selected for his purpose the insignificant base things of the world and the things that are despised and treated in contempt even the things that are nothing so that he might reduce to nothing the things that are so that no one may be able to boast in the presence of God that's through 29 I don't know if I went too far so did we go to 29 in the KJV yeah you did Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, so, uh, any any more? Uh, now that we've looked at the Amplified Translation, any more? Uh, Want to add to that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. But, um, I I want to say that what a delightful day this is going to be when God reveals the truth of of His creation, and all these vain imaginations that man has uh, made people believe. Thank uh, you. Just, just all of them, um, when the truth is brought out, and he he fulfills these verses that that Paul is saying right here, and the, when 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 the curtains pull back and you see that little man running the running the gears, you know the, the little dog rolls, grabs the curtain with his teeth and pulls the curtain back, and you see the little man that's running the Wizard of Oz. Um, I believe that's truth in plain sight. And and these people that call themselves wise and all the all the the the, the words all the all the, the many words that um, deceive people and fool people into trusting in man, all of that's going to be laid waste. And uh, the bottom line of it is, is verse twenty nine that no flesh should glory in his presence. There won't be a thing they can say when when you fully understand how powerful God is when all the lies are stripped away, all the false creations of man. You know, the, the, I, I think of the example of the tower of Babel, um, you know, they were, they were trying to build a tower so tall that they could storm the very throne of God. Um, and he put an end to that. And since then they've been trying to rebuild the tower and they do it in, 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 in uh, more metaphorical ways, because obviously you can't build a, a tower that tall. I mean, um, but they try to, and they they do it with their I ideas, their false ideas that are deceptions. And I, I for one, it's just going to be a glorious day when when the truth is revealed, and nobody can say anything in the presence of a holy, incredible God. I'm looking forward to that day. Hey, uh, brother Luke and Jason. Yes. Nobody is going to stand before God and say, God chose me because I was such and such and such and such. Right. I was so great. Matter of fact, he chose you despite you. Like yeah. there, there's never something in us. And 
that's part of the Calvinism thing that drives me crazy is they try to be humble <laughs> and say it's unconditional election, but secretly every one of them thinks that God chose them yep. as the elect because there was something in them. Yeah. Uh, secretly, everyone does. Yeah. And no flesh is going to glory in his presence. Not one person is going to say God chose me because of something in me. And that's why I do believe he chooses the least of us yeah. to do his will so that he can exalt us. And there's several examples in scripture. Um, someone brought up David. Uh, David was a great man. Yes, God made David a great man. Remember, he was the least of Jesse's sons. Uh, as Brother Luke said, he wasn't even considered. They didn't even consider him. Yeah, and they laughed at him when Saul put his armor on him. Yep. You know, it was like putting on his, his, you know, your dad's clothes or something. Yeah. Make no mistake, God made David a great man. Yes, another, another example is Joseph. Joseph, the, the, the coat of many colors. He boasted so much about his dreams that his brothers got so mad they threw him in a pit to kill him. Uh, you know, and uh, he he's nothing compared to the riches and splendor of Egypt. And God raised him into a position that's second only to the Pharaoh. Oh, sorry. God did that. Amen. It's not because Joseph was special. It's not. God lifted him up to that position. I mean, there, there's examples all throughout Scripture of where God took someone that was that was a nobody. Um, even people that were humble and said, I'm a nobody, God. Why are you choosing me? Moses said you know well i'm i'm slow of speech i you know i can't i can't speak to the people god used him anyway moses is one of the most celebrated uh, characters in scripture god did that it's not because they were great men it's not i can't think of one example of a great man in scripture before god got a hold of him not one mm -hmm. no look at all the disciples none of them were great scholars they were fishermen yep most of them. Yep. And tax collectors and sinners. Yeah. You know. Yep. All right. Um, let's go to the 29 and 30 in the KJV. That, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorifieth, let him glory in the Lord. Man. Wow. Renee? Yeah, man, this is another one of those verses I really love. Uh, obviously, no flesh is going to glory in his presence. As Jason said, nobody started out great, and that's why God chose them. No, God made them great. It says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Who is that? Jesus is. He is that for us. Amen. He's my righteousness. He's my holiness. He is my redemption, and he is my wisdom. It, it has nothing to do with anything that's within me inherently. And it says that according as it's written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. If you're going to lift somebody up, lift up Jesus. It's mm -hmm. always him. You're redeemed because he is your redemption. You're righteous, not of your own actions, but because he is your righteousness. You're holy, not because you're so holy living, as Ray Comfort would say. You're living in holiness as if that is helping you. Be holy in the sight of God? No, he, he makes you holy. Christ is your holiness. Yes. And any wisdom you have is because of the wisdom of the Holy Spirit speaking to you, revealing secret things of God. Mm. So he is all those things. Jesus is those things for us. And I don't mean that in the, the way some people, oh, it's God doing it in me, that false humility. I'm saying that everything has nothing to do with any of the performance, whether it's me or God doing it in me. It's Christ himself that is my righteousness and my redemption and my holiness. Amen. It's him. It, he gives that to me, yep. my faith. So nobody can glory in their flesh, but only glorying in the Lord. Yes. Amen. Um, our, uh, our greatest cause is uh, declaring 
the, the gospel, the good news about the gift of salvation, the guarantee of eternal life. And without any contribution on our part, and this distinction, the last point there, is the distinction between a Christian and a Christian. When I say Christian, I'm saying just people who identify themselves as some kind of a Christian. Start asking people who say they're Christians, are you certain you're going to go to heaven? And if you are certain, why? Based on what? For what reason should God let you into heaven? And you're going to find out that almost all, even professing Christians, are going to bring themselves into the equation and nullify the grace of God and make the cross of none effect because they're not allowing Jesus to get all the glory. But mm. when you start thinking that you've contributed towards it and that you that therefore you can share in the glory because you did your part. Bible says all the glory is for God. Amen. Paul says there where is boasting then it is excluded. If you think that you have anything to do with your salvation except receiving it through faith in Jesus, faith in what he's done for you, paying for your sins, faith in his promise of eternal life and believing that it is finished, it's done, you have eternal life, it's irrevocable, it's guaranteed. That's all that's required of you is believing his promise in his finished work. But if you think that you're making any contribution, changing your life, getting sin out of your life, doing good works that you're going to present to God and say, see, I did my part. You've nullified it. And so you're basically, you're stealing glory from Jesus. The, uh, the Reformation accomplished some great things some bad things came out of the reformation but what i like best about the reformation is what is commonly called the five solas s-o-l-a-s -A -A -S. sola means soul what as in english would be s-o-l-e soul it's the only thing it's an only and the the, the five onlys are uh our salvation is only by the grace of God, only because God is gracious, not because we have any merit, we're totally undeserving. Another only is that uh, self salvation is only because of faith, not because of any religious works that we do, only because of faith, because of belief. And then, and if you think that your, your works contribute to it, then you can boast and you can claim glory for yourself. Also, uh, an, another only is faith is only in Christ. You're not putting faith in Christ and faith in your own contribution to it. No, no faith in self. Faith all, entirely in Christ's finished work and his promise. And then the other only is Gloria, sola gloria, only glory for God. And you cannot have all the glory going to God if you claim that you have contributed to it. If you do not have sola uh, gratia, sola fide, sola Cristo, if you don't have those three, then you can claim glory for yourself. But all the glory has to be go to Jesus. And if you're a lordship heretic, you're stealing glory from Jesus. Amen. The first sola is sola scriptura. In other words, everything I've told you is solely based on this. What the Bible's, Bible tells us. I'm not giving you any of my opinion. I'm not giving you any uh, uh, philosophy uh, or extra biblical uh, opinions. I'm telling you exactly what the Bible says about salvation in Christ and you. I'm going to read it in the Amplified, those last couple of verses. Uh, it says, uh, So that no one may be able to boast 
in the presence of God, but it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, revealing his plan of salvation and righteousness, making us acceptable to God and sanctification, making us holy and setting us apart for God and redemption, providing our ransom from the penalty of sin. So then, as it is written in scripture, he who boasts and glories, let him boast and glory in the Lord. Okay, any, any more after hearing that? What do you th how did they do with those verses? Yeah, I, th I think they did great with them. The, the, the thing that keeps running through my mind, and this, this is a, a verse that we've talked about before, um, but there's not a whole lot said about uh, those of us who are believers. There's not, there's not scriptures going into detail about what we say back to God when we stand before him, when we trust in Christ. But it's certainly plenty to say of what they will say when they stand before God. Well, didn't we do these wonderful works? Didn't we do this and didn't we do that? To me, this is the this is the differentiation between the two groups of people. Um, I love the song. Uh, I can only imagine, and and the lyrics of that song. Is the, the guy's asking the question, you know, will I fall on my knees? Will I will I dance? Well, you know, what what will I do? And it's a powerful song because when I imagine that, I imagine that most of us will be on our knees and we will have nothing to say except that we trusted in Christ. And what they say is, well, look at our works. Didn't we do this and didn't we do that in your name? That's what they're, that's what they're counting on. And they will have nothing to say in front of, in front of God. Um, his words to them will be, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. They never knew him. We know him and we're in awe of him. Yeah, it says God knows those who trust in him. Yeah. So if they're not trusting, but they say they are, but they really aren't. And and that's what makes me crazy because I'm like, wait a minute. Would you ever stand before the Lord and say, uh, I, I should get into heaven because you died for me. And because I like because they give God the credit, you know, for their work. I let your Holy Spirit Ugh. help me keep your commandments. Like that, that's what you're going to bring to him? I mean, and if they say no, I'm like, then why are you adding that as part of the gospel? Amen. Why are you adding that? Why are you saying that? Because that's really what they trust in. If anything's added to Christ, it's really they're not trusting Christ at all. They're trusting in what, what they do, and they twist it, and they try to say it's God doing it in them, and it's anything they can do to take credit for it. Yeah. And I shake for those people that they would stand there and have anything other than the suffering, the blood of Christ and his resurrection to justify them. Well, they carry the audacity they have in this world into the next world. I, I, I don't. I mean, and if they say, no, I wouldn't do that, then why are you preaching it to others? Yeah, because that, that's what they are counting on. They have a tell. That's their tell. They're counting on their works. They're, they're adding some of themselves into the equation. And what they're adding is their filthy righteousness rags. It, it makes me tremble to think about it, to be honest. It I'm concerned for them. I think we all are concerned for them. Me too, buddy. We should we should be on our knees before before an awesome God. We should be on our knees because we're there only because He loved us and because His Son was sent to save us. That's it. It's not for anything that we do. There is not one percent of our works that enters into what Christ did. I'm not going to make what Christ did of no account. I, I'm going to allow Him to be the the. Uh, you were you were saying uh, we allowed you to do this. Um, I, he's already done it. All I do is accept it, uh, and, and I don't get credit for that. But I do get saved. That's it. I don't get any credit for it, but I do get saved because of what he did. It's all what he did. Well, we don't need to look uh, outside of scriptures 
But I do believe that some uh, of the old hymns have also expressed these things so beautifully. The, the, probably my favorite, if I had to pick one, it would be uh, Just As I Am. I think it's in that hymn, there's a line that says that uh, just as I am, without one plea, except thy blood was shed for me. Imagine that you're at the judgment. Now, this is not going to be it's going to happen, even though Jesus, Jesus get, did give us a scenario. He says, there will come a day when you come before me and say, Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful things I did in your name. We did this and this and this and this and this. And I run off a list of all the works they did in the name of Jesus. And he says, depart from me, worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So Jesus does uh, paint a picture of this judgment and people making some kind of a plea. And if they're, you're pleading your self-righteousness, your own works, he says they're works of iniquity. They're filthy rags. But this hymn and the Bible says... I come to Jesus just as I am without one plea except your blood was shed for me. That's, you better, you, if, if, if that was the scenario and you had to plead your case, plead the blood, nothing else. That's um, all we have with us. So uh, now uh, we could go for a couple of verses in the next chapter. Uh, we have time, and there, there are they are connected anyway, this, so we can. But um, let's check on the chat room first, though. Uh, we, I haven't really looked at it all tonight. Uh, oh, Renee put something on all caps. Amen, Luke. Amen. Without one plea, except thy blood was shed for me. Yes. Yeah, if you want to get our attention here uh, with a question, or a statement that you'd like us to respond to, shout it out to us in all caps, and we'll try to uh, answer you, okay? Uh, how's it going in the chat room? Uh, since I haven't been keeping up with it, is everything good? Yeah, everything is good. A lot of people are really seem to be edified by the, yeah. by the broadcast. A lot of yeah, people. there's no, no trolls tonight. Oh, oh, yeah, thank you, Brother Hendricks. Yeah, I did check when... Um, when someone was talking, Hendricks, I got all back on the phone and he left me a voice message. He was all concerned about me because of that video I made today. Apparently, he didn't watch the video. He just read the title. Yeah, he did kind of. <laughs> and the title title of the video is, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, big big problem. Uh, urgent. Bad, no, bad, bad news, urgent. Urgent. Oh, okay, okay. That bad means... news, urgent. That's I think that's you, all you know that. That. because you he's, know all that. he's leaving a message saying, oh, "I'm very concerned, worried. What's going on? I needed to talk to you after seeing that video." But he, if he watched the video, he'd know that there what the problem is. And uh, for those of you in the chat room, I hope you watched that video I made today. It's only eight minutes long, but. Uh, he, that'll bring you up to you know, what we're dealing with. If, if we're going to do more of these programs where we have these group discussions live, uh, we've got to find another way of doing it because uh, the way we're doing it right now, this uh, system is going to be history at, at the end of, uh, was it August 1st or the end of August? What, he's, what is, he's saying August 1st. Yeah, we did. We got a notification when we went live today. Oh, first, remember I was. I think, but very soon uh, this is going to be defunct if we don't find another way of doing it. So uh, please, uh, someone. Uh, oh, Luke, Luke, I thought someone died. Too, you looked like you were going to cry. I was yeah, afraid. yeah. It was. It was a little dramatic. A couple of people immediately were afraid for Renee when they saw the title of the video. Everybody's always concerned about you, Sister Renee. Oh, it's very sweet. My health's actually really good lately. Yeah. Praise God, Renee. That's yeah. awesome. God, amen. Okay. Uh, so put it in all caps. Uh, uh, let me see. How do you rededicate your life to Jesus as a per paradoxical? You mean per prodigal, prodigal son? You don't need to rededicate your life. Your, your, your identity, your standing, 
in, in before God has not changed. Uh, you probably had some consequences if you went astray, the consequences that come with a sinful life. God hasn't stopped fellowship with you. He's He's always got open arms. Uh, you're the one that's turned your back on him. So you don't need to do anything like a, a, a repentant or, or sackcloth and ashes, anonymous user. You're Mad. May I add to that, Brother no, Luke? No, you, no, you can't. <sighs> oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you so much. Um, the prodigal son story uh, for the anonymous user that asked that question. If you look at the story itself, that's the one you're referring to. Um, notice that the guy literally left the pigsty and walked home to be one of his father's uh, hired hands again. That was what was in his mind. He didn't clean himself up. He didn't st stop along the way somehow and try to clean off all the pig crap all over his clothes and all the all the dirt that he'd collected. He walked home to... Uh, to uh, meet his father just as he was. So uh, in asking your question uh, about the prodigal son, uh, you have your answer. You come to him, we come to him just as we are. He does the cleaning up. We don't have to perfect ourselves. We don't have to um, make everything right. Uh, when we're coming to him, we come to him as we are. So whatever your situation is, um, I mean, I wouldn't know without asking you some more questions. Um, but Brother Luke is absolutely right. Uh, you come to him as you are, even now, coming to him as you are, and he'll work out whatever uh, situation you're uh, dealing with him, if you bring it to him. Anyway. And don't stop being his son. It says a son abides in the house forever. Yeah. That's what it says. You, you can't stop being his child. Once you're adopted into his family or born again by the Spirit into God's family, you are his child. Yep. Uh, let, let me uh, also say that uh, the word prodigal is not even in the Bible. Uh, no. I don't like call referring to it as the story of the prodigal son. I refer to it as the story of the backslidden son. And uh, the important thing to get from the story is, is that um, it is possible to be a son. And that means if, if, if you're a son, that means that you were born again spiritually as a child of God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And once that's done, it's just like when you came out of your mother's womb, you can't go back inside. Nothing can undo it and reverse it. You're a son of God. You're a child of God. You have eternal life guaranteed to you permanently, irrevocably. And that's settled. Uh, but you can be a son. And you can backslide. You can go off and get in trouble in life, and you don't change your standing as the, as a, the man's son. Didn't change. You're in the pig's pen, but you didn't become a pig. You're just acting like a pig. Ooh, I like that. So, so uh, yeah, you need to uh, get back uh, uh, doing all the right things for for a lot of different reasons. Don't think you need to do that in order to renew your salvation is if you believed you're a uh, child of god and that's unchangeable um but but you should you you should uh be thankful and, and uh, just as the son was thankful that the father had open arms and embraced him and threw a big party for him isn't the isn't the a natural response for that gratitude and now you want to just just love and serve oh yeah, yeah. You make an interesting point. I just want to add to that. The word prodigal, the meaning of the word prodigal, uh, it's funny that the world chooses that wor word for that story when the meaning of the word isn't even the point of the story. Prodigal means extra extravagant, characterized by wasteful expenditure, yielding abundantly. So they focus on the fact that this guy went out and spent a bunch of money and, and lived riot riotously and all that. And that's not even the point of the story. The things that he did aren't the point of the story. To me, the point of the story is reconciliation. It's him coming back to the father and the father, you know, him, him saying, yeah, just make me one of your hired hands. And, and the father's like, no, get my robe and get my ring and put it on his finger and kill the fatted calf. We're throwing a party because my son that was lost, now he's found. That's, that's the point of the story. So, uh, brother Luke, you're absolutely right. The, the word prodigal isn't 
uh, the correct yeah. word for uh, the particular story. Yeah. Yeah. Celine, Celine said her pastor literally stood up and said, God's love and grace has boundaries. Like, I, I want to know where, what verse he got that from. I thought I mercy endured forever. I'd like to know, too. And I thought where sin abounded, grace did much more hyper, super abound. Where's yeah. the boundaries of his love, and how do we know we've reached it? <laughs> there's, a, there's a very famous sermon uh, uh, titled Run. And uh, I don't remember the guy's name, but uh, he is one of the most powerful, passionate speakers I've ever heard. And the title, you can find this video, I'm sure, on YouTube. Just put in Run, a sermon titled Run. And uh, you'll never encounter a more passionate orator moving. However, the messages are heresy. And uh, it's unfortunate, but because he is such a powerful orator, it relates to this whole chapter here, that don't be deceived because someone is a great speaker or has great passion. Please. Please don't fall for that. Uh, but uh, I was going to say, Run from that church, yep. uh, Celine. We run away from the false uh, gospel churches. Run, don't walk. In that, in that sermon I told you about, the false message is is run away from us. <laughs> He's telling you to run away from us who are saying faith alone. Okay. Um, but I think Hendrix making a good point here. Uh, thank you. Hendrix, you're the captain of the moderators. You're the guy that we depend on so much. And it, that, that's, uh, I appreciate all the moderators, but Hendrix is here every time. And yeah, thank you, Hendrix. He's doing a, a, an unbelievable job. So uh, every moderator, if you just observe what Hendrix does uh, every time, uh, that's the model. Uh, but Hendrix put in here something about um, Everly, Brother Everly. Oh, let me try to find it again. He said, Brother Everly made a video about this uh, prodigal son story, and it's titled, The Father is the Hero. I remember that much. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing it. Well, it's it's in there. He just posted it in the chat room. So Brother Everly, apparently, he has a great video about this uh, story of the backslidden or prodigal son. So watch Brother Everly's uh Video. He's called Wretched Knucklehead. Wretched Knucklehead is, is the name of Brother Everly's channel. But the title is The Father is the Hero. And I think we can gather from the title the, 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 the uh, main message. He absolutely is the hero. Hey, Brother Luke. Yes. Um, Brother Dave said, would we just mention why some people think workers of iniquity in Matthew 721 are Christians who didn't turn away from their sins? I think part of it is the false translation and lack of context. For one, the new ones put practicers of lawlessness. And that would make people think, imply that if you don't keep his law, then you weren't really saved and he never knew you. And another one is just flat out people take it out of context. Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and the false prophets in that verse. Yeah, there, there are a few verses and a few uh, portions of scripture that it's it's almost funny to me how uh, there there's a uh, a term in uh, uh, arguing scriptures that we uh, it's called proof texts and problem texts and uh, a proof text is a verse that we would use to prove our point and a problem text is someone that gives us to refute our position. Mm. Renee specializes in uh, explaining the problem text that people are trying to tell you that, hey, faith alone's wrong. You better repent of that. And they give you a verse that you don't understand. And now you're all confused and worried. So Sister Renee, more better than anybody I know, uh, helps with these problem texts. But there are a few cases where the same verse is a proof text for both sides. And this is uh, the, well, a, a case of that. This account that I already mentioned, 
Jesus says there will come a time, maybe someone can find the exact verses so we can get it word for word, but uh, Jesus says there will come a time when they come to me, he's talking about the judgment, and say, Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful things we did in your name. And they are justifying their salvation. Uh, in other words, he's saying, it's the scenario, why should I let you into heaven? Leave your case. And they said, well, look, all the wonderful things we did in your name. And and uh, they run off this list. And just like the Pharisee it is at the wall, look at all the fasting and all the things that I do in the tithing. And that guy over there is horrible. All these other people, I'm glad I'm not like them. And Jesus said, no, it's the humble one, the tax collector that just says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. He's the one that's justified. So from that account, and the account where Jesus said, they'll come to me, uh, bringing all their works to me to be justified. And uh, I'm going to say, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So uh, the lordship heretics use that verse, that portion of scriptures to argue, see, if you don't have enough works or the right kind of works, uh, you're going to be cast out. Uh, because you didn't do good enough. Oh my gosh. How can we come to that conclusion when, when we can see clearly Jesus is saying that the whole concept of trying to justify yourself to him by your works is the problem. It's not how much or the quality of the works that's at issue. Yeah. It's the fact that you dare to say anything but the blood. Yeah, they're focused on the wrong thing, Brother Luke. Yeah. So, uh, but Renee, I don't know if you found the verses and, and if you have a reason, a more detailed why, uh, or Brother Dave, uh, um, he, I think he might want a, an, an answer on why. Um, uh, you have more to say on this, Renee? Uh, no, I just wanted it to answer his uh, general question why people, you know, twist that to think it means believe. None of those verses that talk about those of iniquity and those that do such things and the unrighteous, none of those are talking about those trusting in Christ. None of those verses are about us. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I, I thought that we could go through a couple of more verses, but we got uh, in de dealing with the chat room here. We've, you did that in Dutch. Uh, we've used up the remainder of the time. <laughs> so let's take the next five minutes or so here to uh, um, kind of sum up our thoughts and, and, and uh, end the program. Uh, and also, before I, I do that, I, I want to make a, a couple of announcements. Um, if you watch the video I made today and you understand the issue at hand, uh, that this live streaming with panelists participating will not be possible through YouTube beginning in about a, the end of this month. I think August 1st, it will no longer be possible to do what we did tonight. But Brother Matthias, uh, he has a method uh, that will allow us to do it, but we will depend on Matthias to be there uh, on all of these programs, uh, kind of producing it behind the scenes, making it happen. So we can continue, but it's asking a lot of Matthias that, that he has to be there all the time. So we need to either train people how to do this, uh, or we need to find another solution to the problem. Uh, and people have made a lot of comments on the video I made today offering other ideas. If you have that other solutions, see, the problem is some of these programs, uh, that, that they will allow me to do a live stream with just me but I won't be able to have any panelists. It'll just be me. I want a program that allows a live program and panelists. Um, uh, so if you know an alternative program, uh, email me, sincitypreacher at gmail.com, and then I'll email you back and give you my phone number, and then we'll discuss it on the phone, and I'll try to figure out, uh, see if I can understand what your solution to the problem is. We... We will be able to do this, but but we're going to be totally dependent on Matthias unless we get others who can help or, or we find an alternative way of accomplishing it. So uh, that's the situation. Um, the other announcement I want to make is that um, 
Uh, this Friday, we're going to have part two of the program uh, that we did uh, a couple weeks ago on a Friday, uh, uh, the Flat Earth discussion. And uh, uh, this this time, we're only going to be talking about, instead of the, our testimonials, the first one was the testimonials of the, the reasons each one of us, there were seven or eight of us, that uh, the, we gave the reasons that each one of us changed our mind on this subject. And that this coming Friday is going to be totally focused on all the scriptures that uh, we believe uh, support this position. Uh, that is going to begin at uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Talk and Doctrine. We're not going to have any time constraints because I told Matthias that we'll go, if we need to go more than two hours and either delay Fellowship Friday or not have Fellowship Friday, we'll go as long as we need to. If we do end it enough time, with enough time for Fellowship Friday, I'll, I'll do it. But I, I don't know how long that program is going to take. I don't want to put time constraints on it. Uh, am I forgetting anything? Are there any other announcements? How about Renee or Quips? Do you have any announcements that you want to make? I do. I just want to remind people to listen to uh, TSL tomorrow because uh, Little Engstrom, who's um, in these live chats um, on our channels, is going to give her testimony. I um, just want to remind people of that uh, if you didn't know about it. Um, she's in the chat here tonight, too, and I'm very excited to, yeah. to, to hear from her. Awesome. That's the only announcement I have. Yeah, I'm eager. and uh, I so, will promote it, too. Can you send me the link so I can give it to people? Yeah. I sure and will, Renee. I'll Thank do you. Is, you know, I've done a lot of these interviews, uh, and uh, uh, it seems that um, people now, uh, the people that wanted me to interview them, it's, it's kind of run its course, and nobody else wants me to interview them, uh, and that's fine. Um, I'm just glad that some people are coming forward and now wanting to give the testimony to uh, Brother Cripps. I'm Thank going you. to take those interviews that you're doing and add them to my playlist interviews. Oh, I'd love it. I would love that. Whether I'm doing the interview or Brother Cripps is doing the interview is irrelevant. I just want to have your interview on my playlist. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Uh, all right. Uh, other than that, I guess, uh, give me your uh, summary of your thoughts on the uh, the last 11 verses of this uh, um, uh, this this study. Go ahead, Renee. Yeah, Renee, you want to go first? Yeah, man, I really like that this was pointing all to Jesus, how the real gospel is foolishness, that people reject it. It's a stumbling block. That it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You can't get clearer than that. And, and how he uh, never chooses what the world considers something of value. He always chooses something in its basis form and lifts it up, um, just as he did with the nation of Israel and every other great man in the Bible. It was nothing in them that made them great. God uh, made them great. So I really love that everything was pointing to God. Uh, no glory in us. There's no way you could read this section and think there's anything we could possibly boast in so i always love it when um sections of scripture point only in god and glorifying god mm -hmm. yeah yeah amen all right uh brother cripps uh give us a summary of your, the uh the study tonight yeah absolutely i agree and i'll do the whole chapter too as, um, uh, renee has mentioned um as we saw like i think it was the first 11 verses la last week Mention Jesus' name over and over and over again. Um, it, it seemed like as if Paul was trying to get our focus on the right thing. Um, if we're focused on Christ, we're not focused on our own sin, we're not focused on our own works, we're not focused on any way that we did something in order to be saved, but we're focused on Christ, you're in the right place. You're absolutely in the right place. And um, I, I love this, uh, the, the last week and this week, and I'm excited about getting into the next chapter. And um, I, gosh, I just appreciate being part of these uh, uh, broadcasts, and I appreciate the chat. Good night, chat. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Luke, Paul wants to do an interview with you, too. Okay, good. All right. I'd love to do that, Matthias. Uh, the... Uh, I, I have to correct you, uh, Brother Cripps. Um, this chapter is 31 ver verses, and it's taken three Wednesdays. We did 
10 verses and then the second 10 and now the last 11. So it's a total of almost five hours of study on this chapter. And on one hand, the chapter was not super deep, but we there was a lot to talk about, a lot to celebrate, I would say. This chapter is a, a chapter that is, uh, uh, oh, it's not like a, some kind of a paradoxical Rubik's Cube figuring out the doctrine. It's just recognizing this is all about Jesus. Don't you dare bring yourself into the equation and take any glory. It's Jesus, 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 ten times. And then to the very end, don't take, think about getting any glory for yourself. That's how I would sum it all up. Yeah, my apologies. Three three nights instead of two, my apologies. Yeah, well, don't, don't make any more mistakes. I'll try. <laughs> All right, that's it for tonight. Uh, thank you, uh, chat room and moderators and uh, Renee and Cripps. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.